going to talk about tough times today, and I want to ask you a couple of questions and ask if you think that these statements are, are true. Here's a statement I've heard some people seem to imply that is true. Here it is. If you do the right thing, if you speak the truth and you treat others with value, you will never be mistreated. Is that true or false? false. What do you say? Yeah. yeah, that's false, isn't it? How about this? How about if you obey God, you won't have to go through tough times and death will never prematurely knock at your door and you'll be healthy and wealthy and wise. Is, is that true? No, that's, that's, that's not true either. And one of the ways we know that's not true is because, one, we know our experiences, and every person in here, we will go through tough times if we have not yet, like significantly tough times, right? Like tough times when you go, is it worth living today? Tough times. And we know this to be true not only because of our experiences, we also know this to be true because of what happened with Jesus and his own disciples, And so today we're going to talk about that. And as I was structuring how we're teaching through Matthew, at first I thought, you know, we're going to breeze through this because there's not a whole lot of of application there and there's not a whole lot of teaching that Jesus does and what we're going to look at today. And, And then I kind of had to settle in and go, you know what this teaches us? It teaches us how Jesus and his disciples dealt with tough times. And because we go through tough times, we can trust in him as well. And and if you're following and listening to somebody who told you that following Jesus means that you're going to have physical, emotional, financial, relational peace by following him, and you're free from tough times, you've been lied to. (laughs) And so today's study, we're going to see Jesus and his disciples as they experience very difficult days, tough times. And we're going to find from our compassionate king the, the hope as he is willing and able to walk with us through tough times, and very significantly, watch this, because he experienced it himself. So let's pray. We'll open the scripture. Lord, please, we trust you and we ask you today to speak to us through the scripture. You know what every person in the room is dealing with. You know the concerns that are a front burner of our minds. And I pray right now you would, you would step right in front of that, And by the power of your scripture, you would minister to us, you would encourage us, you would confront us and correct us where needed. That's what we ask. Amen. Amen. Here we go. We pick up where we left off, and we're in Matthew chapter 13, and we've talked about the parables and and the parables of the kingdom. And here we go. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there and coming to his hometown. Where would that be? Oh, what's his hometown? Where he grow up? Nazareth. Come to his hometown, Nazareth. He, Jesus, began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. They're asking a question. The question was, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Scholars who look back at that day and do their best to formulate kind of what the population size, the largest population size from what I read would have been somewhere between 1,500 to 2,000 people in Nazareth, and others say it probably would have been closer to 500 people. Could we in uh, Madison uh, understand the size of that? Yeah, matter of fact, that's much smaller than what our city is. It's much smaller than what our county is, for sure, with 20,000 people, roughly. So it isn't, isn't this true? So we know kind of how small places work. This is a small place that Jesus grew up. And as Jesus began to go teach in their synagogue, I want you to think about this. It's not like they built synagogues every year. This was probably the same synagogue that he had been in as a child, a boy growing up. And so these people, like children that we've seen grow up in, in our church body, they've probably seen Jesus grow up in Nazareth. He didn't start his ministry until he's 30 years old. He had worked with, likely with his dad. There is one point where Jesus is referred to as the term that we typically translate as a carpenter. And we're going to see his dad was that. And they work with more than just wood, by the way. They work with stone as well. So they could be a carpenter or mason in that way and in, in how, they, how they work. And yet, the people, when they heard Jesus, they were amazed at his teaching as now this, the one that used to be the little boy, right, uh, in synagogue that probably listened pretty well and probably obeyed his, his, uh, his teachers, right? Uh, uh, certainly did. And then, and then Jesus now has grown up as this young man in his early, early 30s. Uh, I've had the experience of going back home to Sarasota where a lot of people saw me grow up, you know, from a, a little tyke and, and now had the privilege to go in there several times and, and teach at the church that I grew up being taught at. 
that many of the adults as I look out that are your age and older, and of course, many have passed on, that, that I look out and I can see different faces and going, this person taught me when I was in second grade and third grade, and this person taught me when I was in fifth grade, and this person when I was in student ministry, and this person continued to impact my life and encourage me. You with me? I can only imagine what it was like for Jesus in this way, but this is when it gets weird, and we're about to see this, because these people, having known Jesus and his family, they know that Jesus has, in, in their presence, has never had formal education and training. He didn't have a seminary degree. He, he never had a rabbi come by and say, hey, follow me, and I'll teach you my, my, my ways. He, he, didn't, he didn't have, uh, he, he wasn't known by the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and such. I mean, the most that we see about Jesus is when he's a young boy, right? And he shows up to the temple and he starts talking with the leaders and they're blown away by his wisdom and knowledge at this young age. But beyond that, in Nazareth, I mean, they're going, yeah, it's, it's Yeshua, it's, it's Jesus. We're, we remember him. He was a nice young kid and, you know, he knew some scriptures and, and such. And that's kind of all it was. Here's the other thing is, is that evidently, and, and I know there are traditions that have arisen, but not from scripture. Evidently, Jesus had never performed a, a miracle as a little kid and growing into that time before he's 30. We don't see any record in the scripture of Jesus performing any miracle until he's 30 years old when he starts his ministry. So imagine this, imagine this, if you will, that, that Jesus grew up in, in Madison and Jesus, you know, was the kid growing up and now he's teaching. We're kind of, we're, we're amazed by his teaching. We're going, where do you get that from? Like he doesn't have formal education, but he's, they, we're amazed by that. But then we're hearing about miracles he performed. And yet many of us, we've never seen him do that. And we certainly never saw him do that in the many years he's grown up in Nazareth. And so what we're going to see is they were amazed and they're asking, where do you get these miraculous powers? But what we're about to see is that question was not like, it didn't seem to be a legitimate question. Please tell us where you got this. Matter of fact, can I remind you that there were those who recognized Jesus' miraculous powers who blamed those miraculous powers on who? Satan, Satan the devil, in the Gospel of Matthew, correct? All right, look at this. Here's the question they're asking. And isn't he the carpenter's son? This is, of course, Joseph, jo Joseph. And, of course, they thought he was Joseph's son, and he's not really. He's the adopted son, right? And, and they, they, think this is, they think this is him. We don't know what happened to Joseph, by the way. There's a lot of thoughts that at this point, because Joseph never shows up in any of the narratives when Jesus and his mother and his brothers and sisters do, as we'll see in a second. Joseph isn't mentioned again, so a lot of people think that maybe he's died early, and Jesus has taken on this, uh, this job of being this carpenter. Look what he says. So he says, isn't this the carpenter's son, and isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his, help me, aren't his brothers, and four of them are named, James, by the way, the, the better translation for James, I've told you this, is actually Jacob or Jacob. For whatever reason, in English, we translate that into James to keep that away from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but it's exactly the same word as Jacob. So that would be the Jewish name, the Hebrew name. And so you've got James or Jacob, Yosef, okay? So there's a, a, there's a guy named after his dad, Simon, or we would say Simon, and then who? Judas. You know, brother, Jesus had a brother named Judas. By the way, two of these guys are later named, they actually write what we believe to be from them letters, and one of them is James or Jacob, we've talked through that before, and who? Jude, which is short for Judas. Back in the day, Judas wasn't a bad name, right? Uh, I don't know anybody named Judas today. We have a, 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 a young guy in middle school named Judah, which is a cool name, but Jesus came from the tribe of, guess what? Judah, and this is where this name undoubtedly came from, Judah or, or Jude or Judas. This is the same name in this way. And then they ask this, and aren't all his, help me, with us? Aren't all his sisters with us? And here's the question again, where did this man get all these things? Now, contrary to Catholic tradition, Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Some of you might go, what's that mean? Perpetual means like forever and ever and ever and ever. And so Mary, the, the Catholic a tradition that arose is that Mary never had intimacy with Joseph ever, and she never had children ever outside of the, the Lord Jesus. And so they would say that these, these people, the, the word for, for uh, children can also be translated as like cousin. And so they would take it there and say, these are cousins of Jesus. 
A lot of problems with that. Uh, the first problem is this, is that Mary actually married Joseph. And in order to be legitimately married in Jewish culture, you would have to consummate the marriage. And so we're actually told by Matthew, and I just want to remind you of, of what Matthew says as we back up into Matthew chapter 1 that we would typically read around Christmas time. And I want you to see what Matthew writes. And here's what he writes. And when Joseph woke up, this is the angel speaking to Joseph, say, hey, go marry her. She's not been with another man type of thing. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his what? Wife. Now, this is interesting. Watch this. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him, that is, Joseph gave him the name Jesus Yeshua. In other words, for that nine months of pregnancy, they were very careful not to be involved intimately together until after what? The birth of Jesus, which then it clearly implies that after that, guess what? They did what married couples do, what God intended, and this is how they have these four brothers and multiple sisters. We don't know how many sisters Jesus had. Does that make sense? Now, the second thing is, as Jesus had brothers and sisters, again, we, I already mentioned this, but I mean, these people were actually named. I, they're, we talked about who they are and the fact that, that they're named. And so the hometown folks were amazed by Jesus. And yet there's this cynical sense of where did he get all this stuff from? And what I think is many of them are implying that he didn't get this from God. Again, many would say he probably got this from the devil. You'd think that they would be happy that this one who has become famous from their small town is now being greatly used. Our small town has several sports stars who've gone to play professionally. I know some that were years and years and years ago, but the, the time that I've been in Madison, we've had several, I'll mention three, Jacoby McDaniel, y'all remember him? Joby, Jacoby played football and baseball, and he could have gone and played professional ball. He had, he had, been, uh, he had been drafted for professional baseball. He went on to play professional football with the Cleveland Browns. He played at Florida State, a defensive tackle. There was another guy that, this is a fine young guy, Chris Thompson. Chris Thompson played at Florida State, was a great running back for Florida State, went on to play for several different teams. And uh, he played for a while with the Redskins and when they were called the Redskins, and then he played for Jacksonville. And a fine young guy has invested a lot in this uh, in this place, in our culture. And then there's a guy by the name of Lorenzo Kane that never played baseball until his sophomore year. And he, he played so well that he ends up getting, uh, getting drafted and goes on and plays. And he was, I think he was MVP uh, of the World Series. I mean, my goodness, is that incredible? Matter of fact, there are several places when you come into the county of Madison, you'll see something that is an honorary Lorenzo Kane. And those guys, I mean, they should be, right? They should be rightly honored in our culture, and we're grateful for that. But far from being honored, Jesus isn't, doesn't seem to be honored in his own hometown. Hmm. Let's look what happens, verse 57, the scripture says, and they took offense at him. The people were offended by Jesus. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Hmm. Why were they so offended at Jesus? I, I think partly, again, they've seen little Yeshua grow up, and there's, it's weird because there's this concept like if you don't know them, somehow you can hold them in higher esteem, right? But if you know them, you can go, yeah, I remember little Yeshua back in the day and his snotty nose or whatever. You know, they would say they couldn't, again, say he's been disobedient. He would not have been. And I can only imagine the chatter going on. It could have been something like this. This can't be the Messiah. How would God choose Nazareth of all places for the Messiah to grow up? And after all, we know his family. And then the Messiah is supposed to be a conqueror. He's not, he's not just a miracle worker who goes teaching even peasant people all over Israel just because because they listen. This can't be a small town boy, this can't be the one who the Jewish nation has been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years. Craig Keener said it well. He asked this question, how could anyone believe that God has stepped into history in the person of a young man who spent most of his life in their community? And can I remind you that Nathaniel, when he hears about Jesus from Philip and Philip says, hey, we found the Messiah, he's from Nazareth, what was Nathaniel's response? Great, because Nazareth, that's where we're expecting the Messiah to come from. No, what do he say? Can anything what? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, they're expecting the Messiah is going to be somewhere around Jerusalem and the temple, and right? 
And that's not how it shook out. And I want to give you a little bit more context. And so we're going to read a big chunk of scripture briefly, but I want you to see this from Luke chapter four. And Don's going to shoot that up on the screen. But I want you to see what Luke gives us some background, evidently about a a time before that Jesus had taught in the synagogue. And now this seems to be in Matthew a time later. And here's what it says. And he, Jesus went to Nazareth and where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it's written, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Yahweh is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? And they said, surely, and Jesus said, surely you will quote this proverb, physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what you have heard that, that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown, I assure you, that there are many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, watch this, but to a widow of Zarephath in the region of Sidon. You go, yeah, what? Here's what Jesus is saying. Y'all realize that 850 years ago when Elijah was around, that Elijah, in spite of the fact that many people in Israel had famine and had difficult days going on, that Elijah didn't go to minister to them. Instead, he went to a little Gentile woman outside of Israel. Hmm, he's not done. And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha, the prophet. And yet not one of them was clean, but only Naaman, the Syrian, is he Jewish? No, no. In other words, Jesus goes, you know, a prophet is not honored in her hometown. And what's happened is prophets have been rejected throughout Israel before. And so what God did is God took the prophet out of Israel and they went and ministered to somebody who was a Gentile. You think Jewish people like that? No, I know they didn't like it because the rest of the story, I'd like to show you actually from where Nazareth is. Would you like to go to Nazareth briefly? Watch this. So here we are in Israel. This is Nazareth, right across the way where Jesus grew up. And this is the place where the scripture says, when they didn't like what Jesus had to say, the people took him to the edge of a cliff intending to throw him off. Now, I live in Madison. And in Madison, if you tell that story about somebody in Madison, we go, what cliff? There are no cliffs. The scripture's true. What it says is true. The topography of it, the geography of it. And this is beautiful Nazareth. Look at that. Amazing. If you're interested in going to Israel, going, Lord, again, willing in uh, February 25, so talk with me, but we'll go to Nazareth. It's an incredible place. It is mountainous. You can see stuff all from out there, and this is where it makes sense now, doesn't it? When they went to go throw them off a cliff, guess what they could have done if if Jesus had allowed it? Could have thrown them off a cliff because there are actual cliffs that are there. And so they were so they had been so offended by him previously, right? And he shows up, I think Matthew's given the, the later time, and he shows up later, and, and many of them, they remember that, and they remember the things Jesus said. And so there's this offense, and things only got worse for Jesus as we move into another chunk of the story. Look at what Jesus has to say, this, this good reminder. He says this. He says, the student is not above the teacher. Remember when Jesus had told them this earlier? And he said, nor a servant above his master. And it is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. It's no brainer, right? They end up being like the person who's training them. And if the head of the household has been called Beelzebul, which is a term they use for Lord of the Flies, it was a, a funny, sarcastic, you know, word they were using referring to the devil. If the head of the household is called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. And so watch this. Now the disciples of Jesus, like Matthew, the author of this text that was probably there with Jesus when this occurred, they see in Jesus' own hometown how the people are offended by him and how persecution comes to Jesus. If if they're offended with me, they're going to be offended with you, he taught them. And so here we go into Matthew chapter 14 as another, another story picks up. 
Here's what it says. And at that time, the Tetrarch heard reports about Jesus. Herod is, knows the Tetrarch. He's referred to as a king. And, and it says this, and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from what? From the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work with him. Wait a second, John the Baptist risen from the dead? Yeah, that would be miraculous because John the Baptist had died. And then we might go, how did John the Baptist die? Which is a great question, which is what Matthew now is gonna back up and give us the story about that. And you'll see now why Herod is very concerned that Jesus maybe is the risen John the Baptist. And so here's what we see, verse three. And now Herod had arrested John the Baptist and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother, Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So watch this. You've got this leader, this, this great politician of the day, this guy who has authority. And what's ended up happening, we'll see in a second, is that Herod is, is really, his name is Antipas. And so he's in the Herod family. Herod Antipas has a brother named Herod Philip, and he takes Philip's wife, whose name is Herodias, which is in honor of Herod the Great. We'll talk about this in just a second. And the scripture says that John would say to Herod, what you're doing is immoral. What you're doing is unlawful. You've taken your brother's wife. Hmm. Politicians don't like to be called out in front of people, right? No difference here. Herod wanted to kill John, the scripture says, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. And so here's kind of some imagery I can show you. The top one is Herod the Great. And Herod the Great had three sons that we know of. He probably had a lot more, but he had Archelaus, he had Antipas, and he had Philip. Here's what ends up happening. Archelaus marries a woman and Archelaus has a daughter named Herodias. You with me? And so Herod, Antipas, and Philip, Herodias is their niece. You with me? This is their brother's daughter. Philip ends up marrying his brother's daughter, his niece, Herodias. And later when it ends up happening, although Herod Antipas has a wife, he divorces his wife. He gets Herodias to divorce her husband, Philip, his brother, and they, they get married. And what John says is, I don't care if you say you're married, you're doing what's unlawful. You are still married to the other person. You're in adultery. Wow. This is the story. And now Herod Antipas has been in power for over 30 years. Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill Jesus at his birth, has been gone since not long after the birth of Jesus. He's, he died. And now Herod Antipas, he has this huge birthday party, and this most wicked event occurs, and many of you might know this story. Verse 6, and on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias, so now Herodias has her own daughter, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod, this is Herod Antipas, so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. In other words, in front of the whole crowd, he said, this is so wonderful. Your dancing is probably erotic, whatever. It's so wonderful that, I listen, I'm, I'll give you up to half my kingdom in front of everybody. He says this. He's probably been drinking too much, I'm guessing, to say something like that. And prompted by her mother, prompted by Herodias, who is Herod Antipas' wife now, she said, give me here on a platter the head of who? Of John the Baptist. Hmm. Well, now Herod is in a pickle because he's afraid of the Jewish people. This is why he hadn't killed John yet anyway, right? And he sort of liked hearing John preach, the scripture says in other places. And so you got that going on. But he just made a commitment in front of everybody at his birthday party. I'll give you up to half my kingdom, whatever you ask. And she says, all I want is John the Baptist said on a platter. This makes sense. Verse nine says, and the king was distressed. He's, he's struggling. He's in this pickle. But because of his oaths and his dinner guest, he ordered that her request be granted. And he had John beheaded in the prison and his head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. What kind of wickedness is that? What do we have to eat? Is this veal? Is this, no, 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 this is the head of John the Baptist. How nasty is this? And then the scripture says that John's disciples came and took his body, as disciples of John the Baptist, came and took his body and buried it. And then they went and told who? They went and told Jesus. 
And when Jesus heard of what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Things just got real, y'all. Because see, up until this point, and I realized there were times that people wanted to pick up stones to kill Jesus. There was this time they were going to take him off and throw him off the cliff, but it hadn't happened, right? Jesus got away. That didn't happen. There were lots of threats that were made, and John the Baptist had even been put in prison, which would not be a good thing. But you know what hadn't happened? Followers of Jesus hadn't been killed yet. And now John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest man who had ever lived, the greatest prophet who had ever lived. Amazing. Jesus said that about him. John the Baptist, who had been righteous, who had lived righteous, who had spoken truth, who had pointed at other people as the forerunner of the Messiah to Jesus being the true Messiah. And John the Baptist He doesn't just die of old age. He doesn't die in prison. He doesn't have a a great, beautiful burial where this prophet is honored. No, they lop his head off. I would submit to you that the disciples of John, that was a very tough time for them. Would you agree? The guy who had trained them, the guy who had shared the message of the Messiah over and over and over and over and over again, the guy that so many had come out to listen to him speak, who had who had been baptized by him, right? That guy who had proven to be a righteous servant of the one true God gets his head taken off. You know what David says in the Psalms? He says this, God, why is it that the righteous suffer while the wicked prosper? You ever wondered that before? You ever wondered? Do you think this is one of those moments? Maybe the disciples of John are thinking this. And by the way, some of the disciples of John are now disciples of who? Jesus. Andrew was one of those. Remember that? When John the Baptist first saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he he tells Andrew and whoever the other disciple is to go follow Jesus. And they start following Jesus instead. Do you think some of the disciples of Jesus are, are struggling with this fact that they've just heard as they're standing with Jesus. Disciples of John show up and say, Jesus, we got to tell you something. You think Jesus struggled with this? The scripture doesn't tell us, but I'm, I'm betting you, y'all, there are tears that are shed over this one. You're going, how could this be? And again, there's nothing in the text, but I just know how human beings work. Isn't it true when tough things happen to people who are godly, what question do we ask? God, why would you let that happen to one of your servants? Isn't this true? And here's what I know about, about Jesus. Jesus took this so, so heavily he said, we got to go from this place. And they leave Nazareth where he's already been rejected by his hometown. He's just heard of John the Baptist's death. You might go, yeah, Jackie, but Jesus is God in skin. He is, but he's in what? Skin. He's fully human. Does he experience what human beings experience? Absolutely. And Jesus takes his disciples and he said, we got to go to a quiet place. We got to get away. And so they did. And they withdrew crossing the Lake Galilee. It is a lake. It's not, we call it the sea, but it's, it's, it's a lake. It's fresh water to a solitary place. And here's what I know about every person in the room, including me. Every person here has gone through or will go through tough times. How many of you have gone through such tough times that you're wondering if you're going to make it the next day? A lot of us, right? And if you haven't, guess what's going to happen? One day, you will. That's going to happen. The times when death comes knocking at our door prematurely, the time when hot tears slow down our face because of the pain that we experience or the pain we have over what somebody else is going through. You know what I wish? I wish in those moments that we had a God who actually cared about us. Don't you? I wish we had a God 
who wasn't so far off and distant and just somewhere out there that actually gave a care about what was going on with us. Don't you wish we had that? And we do. And we do. Because we have a compassionate king who is willing and able to help us in tough times. Through our tough times. Do you remember our study in Hebrews and we're almost done? Do you remember our study in there? We Lots of times we ran up on stuff like this. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says, chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet did not sin. Did Jesus understand temptation, y'all? Yep. The only difference is he never sinned. He never fell to the temptation. Does, does he understand what it's like for a human being and the struggles that we face, the temptations we face? Did he understand? Yes. Look at this. And then he says this, and let us then approach God's throne of, help me what? Grace. A beautiful word. And let us approach God's throne of grace with what? Confidence. Confidence in us, in our goodness? No. Watch this, we approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy, here we go, and find grace to help us when? In our time of need. Another way we could say it is in our tough times. In our tough times, we can go to our our God and we can say, we need your help. And we have confidence that he hears us and we're gonna receive his grace and his mercy, whether it's temptation that we're going through. That word temptation can be translated testing, by the way. So it's this idea, it can carry both of sinful temptation that we face and maybe we've even fallen to. And the other idea is of testing difficult times like Jesus went through testing. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? We see in Matthew 4, we studied it a while back. Remember that? Did Jesus face actual temptations that would have been a struggle? Yeah, like he's not eaten for 40 days and the devil goes, hey, you know what? You could turn that stone into a piece of bread and you could eat today. Remember? Huh. Here's what I know. It's when we're experiencing tough times. It's when we're facing temptation or falling to temptation that as Christians, we ought to know where to turn. Because we have a compassionate king who has gone through what we've gone through. And he understands what it's like to be persecuted. Nazareth, right? He understands what it's like to lose a loved one in a horrific way, John the Baptist, right? I know I've told you this story, but it forever has impacted me. That very first day that my wife, Tanya, was going to have chemotherapy, and we didn't know what all that entailed. We all we knew is we we're supposed to be in there for three or four hours, and you know they're going to be pumping stuff into her body, and and you know when she's going to lose her hair shortly, and all, all you know we didn't know we didn't know what it was going to be like. And we're in Tallahassee at the cancer treatment center, and we're sitting waiting our turn. And in walks a lady and comes up and meets us, and she starts talking with us, and it becomes pretty obvious to us that she's a follower of Jesus. And she begins to tell her story as she says, ask, what's going on with you, Tanya? And Tanya begins to share. And she goes, sweetie, you're going to be okay. You're going to make it through this. She said, 10 years ago, I was in the same place that you're at. 10 years ago, I was here. I had cancer. I had to have chemo too. And you're going to be okay. And she said, can I pray for you? And a stranger, the first time we had ever set our eyes upon this lady, so ministered to us. Watch this not because she didn't know what we were going through, but because she had been through it and she cared. And this is amazing because as the writer of Hebrews writes this about approaching God's throne of grace with confidence, you might remember other times that people approached king's thrones. You remember Esther? She's one of the, she's the queen. And yet, She's concerned about approaching the king's presence. You know why? Because the kings could have said, I didn't invite you to come talk with me. You're dead. Do you remember that? You can go read about it in Esther chapter five. And yet here's the picture. Watch this. Not, Not that king, not the multiple kings that have lived after that king, but watch this. The sovereign king of the universe. Here's what he says to his followers. 
you're struggling. You're facing tough times. Your king who jumped into skin understands. Come to me. Have confidence to come to me. Approach my throne of grace to find help in your time of need, to find help in the most difficult, tough times. Come to me. Is that not a great promise? And can I remind you a couple of times of when Jesus talked about this and disciples of Jesus got it? You remember when Jesus said this in John 16, 33? When he said these words, have peace in me. In this world, you will have what? Trouble. You will have tough times. He told his first followers, he said, but be brave, be courageous. Then he says this, because I have defeated the world. Jesus warned us, y'all, that we're going to go through tough times, right? Somebody's told you different. They're telling you something different than what Jesus said. And so when tough times come, why should we be so amazed that tough times hit us? Guess what tough times come to? Everybody. And then Simon Peter, the disciple of Jesus, he later wrote about tough times. He talked about humbling yourself before the Lord, and he would lift you up. And he talked about the struggle that followers of Jesus were going to experience and the persecution, and he pens these beautiful words. Look what he writes. Give all your worries or anxieties or cares to him because he what? He cares about you. You know who Peter's talking about, right? He's talking about the Lord Jesus who Peter walked with and talked with and laughed with and cried with and was disciplined by and encouraged by, and watch this, who was there when Jesus was persecuted by his own hometown, who was there when Jesus got the news that John the Baptist had been beheaded. And he says to followers of Jesus, give your worries to him. You know why? Because he what? He cares for you. Did Peter know if Jesus cared for him? Absolutely. We haven't had the privilege of looking our Savior in the face yet, right? But I can imagine when we do, the scriptures like this are going to jump out of, out of our mind and we're going to see the living King who cares about us right there. And so the first followers of Jesus, they remembered this most important message. They remembered that God's love was forever demonstrated later as the story goes on at the cross. Their circumstances would change just like ours. There would be good days. There would be difficult days. And they would stop doing what maybe some of us have done when, you know, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Things are good, he loves me. Things are bad, maybe not so much loves me, right? We go through that process. And in tough times, when tough times came, here's what they understood, that the cross always outweighs our circumstances. That the cross always outweighs our circumstances. Again, you've experienced this before, Tanya and I, I've experienced this when we got the message about the cancer and we sat there not knowing what to do and we stared at the wall for 10 minutes. We finally prayed and we prayed something like this, Lord, we know that you love us. We don't understand this. We don't like it. We pray you take it away. But we know that you love us because you showed it where? Not the cross. And if we Christians, if we could go back to one day, if you're not a Christian yet and you're here, you're watching, if we could go back to one day in all of history and see the, the unblemished lamb of God give himself on the cross to make payment for our sin, we would never wonder ever again if he actually loves us. And I would submit in the most difficult days when the cancer hits, when when death comes to our door, when health crisis come, when financial strain, all that stuff happens, when relationships are torn apart. In that moment, we can say, I hate this. I don't like this, but here's what I know. I know that you love me. Greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that. And if somebody has told you this false claim, then you need to stop in your tracks and minimally in your mind go, that's not true. This claim that, that God will never give you more than you can handle. Here's a Greek word for that, baloney. That's, that's it. God will give you more than you can handle. You know why? Because he's done it in your life and my life. 
It's not abuse a text that says God won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can handle, but will provide a way of escape. That's Corinthians says that, but yeah, he'll provide a way of escape. That's right. But it never says he won't let you go through more than you can handle. And you know one of the reasons why? Here's why, because here's what I know and we're done. Because tough times drive us to seek God's presence, doesn't it? Tough times when it's bigger than we can handle. Don't get it. Well, God must think I'm so strong because he will never give me more than I can handle. Therefore, he thinks I'm so strong. You're not so strong. Neither am I. And that's why we're weeping our eyeballs out and going, God, I need help. Anybody else been there? If you haven't been, you know what's going to happen? You will be. Tough times drive us to seek God's presence. And you you know what else they do, especially for Christians? Not only seek God's presence, but we seek God's people. Church, I I know, I, I hope you don't get tired of hearing this. I am forever grateful to you for the way you came to our aid when Tanya developed cancer. Thank you. We could have never gone through that alone, ever. And you came beside us. Thank you. We desperately needed you. Thank you. And now we've done that for other people in different ways. And there've been times that somebody came to you to help you because we're brothers and sisters. Isn't this true? And if you're, if you're here and, and you're not normally plugged into church and most of you are, but if you're watching online and you're, for whatever reason, you're watching this dude you've never heard of for whatever reason, here's the thing. If you're not plugged into a church, you're missing the body of Christ. You're missing people who will love you and do life with you. When I think of church, I don't, I don't think of a building. I don't think of an event. I think of you. I think of your faces and I think of your stories and I think of your love and I think of your food and I think of your servanthood. Thank you. And watch this. Tough times drive us to seek God's presence. Tough times drive us to seek God's people. And then tough times ought to also drive us to share the message of the cross with others. Isn't that true? When others are going through difficult days, let's not say, well, it's no big deal. And you know, it's God's will. No, no, no. Here's what we do. We go, you know what? I don't understand either. I hate this too. I hate that you're going through that too. But here's what I know. God's love for you is not based on your circumstances. He loves me. He loves me not. God's love for you was proven where? At the cross. And during the most horrific, difficult, tough times of your life, if you're a follower of Jesus, you and I can lean on what the Lord has done for us at the cross. And we can say, I don't like this stuff. I hate this stuff. I wish it would go away. And we can go, but you know what, Lord, you love us. I don't want to doubt that ever again. I'm sorry that what we talked about today has nothing to do with real life for you and me. I'm sorry that this text that Jesus doesn't do a whole lot of teaching, we've really struggled to find application for. I'm convinced this is exactly what the Lord wanted to minister to us about today. Isn't that good? Aren't the scriptures good? Isn't Jesus wonderful? He's worthy of our lives. And if you want to talk more about him, it would be a great privilege. Would you sit down and talk with me, our staff, deacons, wives, another Christian who really lives their faith out? That would be our great privilege. We'd love to talk with you further. If you're going through difficult times, don't hold on to that and go, well, it's just me and God, and we got this, and God won't give me more than I can handle baloney. You say, God, I need your help, and then you reach out to God's people and say, I need your help. And Christians, let's be ready to help. Let's be ready to comfort those with the comfort that God has given us, right? So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this great truth from your great scriptures. You are a great, compassionate, loving king. Thank you for being so kind to us. Thank you for being so truthful. Thank you for going through the stuff that we go through. And you you fully understand, you, you, from a human standpoint, you've proven that you understand. You've proven that you love us. And then you give your life to pay for our sins. Thank you, Lord. My prayer would be, Lord, if there's anyone who's listening today who doesn't know you, they're not sure if they die today, what happens to you, to them, they're not Sure, their life, there's, there's no evidence in their life that they're following you. They don't have hope and joy that lasts even when tough times come because they're living for the next event, the next party, the next relationship, the next purchase. And I pray today would be the day as your spirit moves on souls that people would say, Jesus, I need you. I need to know you. And I need to trust you, be faithful to you in the good times and the bad times and sickness and in health. And Lord, I pray for believers that you would 
encourage us today and help us see that we, we have opportunities to minister to people in your name and to point them to the message of the cross and then to be there to actually put our hands out and care for people. Thank you for how you've used this church to do that in the past. May you be honored in all things. Amen.